Up an important thing is that money and the market are both things created by governments for when governments want to hand off way to do policy. And caps are constantly frustrated because what they want is a state without a state. Well, they want to be the state. They want to have so much power that they become the state. Really and truly, right? You know, Mar Murray Rothbard may have had like noble intentions theoretically, but that's not what the people who've adopted his theories believe. That is what neoliberalism is, anarcho-monarchism, right? Friedrich Hayek said it himself. The democracy was bad because it allowed people to fight over resources based upon theoretical claims to it, based upon um, the fact of entitlement rather than how best that they can compete for those resources. So when democracy can give people resources they technically don't earn, as far as Hayek would call it, he thinks that democracy should essentially be abandoned and we should just have an oligarchic class of people who understand how to maximise competition in charge of the whole country and the whole economy. Because as soon as you interject in, in, influence any democracy, people will use democracy to fight over resources rather than competition, which obviously uh, is the underlying precept behind neoliberal orthodoxy, is that competition is always good and you should create competition where there is none to ensure that everything is marketised. And I quite, I quite frankly, I'm fucking sick of competing. I'm sick of things being in competition. I would very much like things to be cooperative. I would like a cooperative economy. I want people to start adhering to a social contract again. I would like there to be a community, but we can't do that when everyone's atomised. Everyone's an individual competing with each other in a global market, in a societal market, for every single facet of our existence. Well, that's, that's what I'm saying, Donnie Marco, is that neoliberalism was, was essentially had to be injected into the US and the UK as a bribe to a, a, a large generational cohort of baby boomers by gifting them the, the, the proceeds of the public sector sell-off when, when these things were marketized, right? All of these marketizations, these sell-offs, these demutualizations created a short-term amount of additional wealth that was gifted to a singular large generation. And because neoliberalism prioritizes competition, it prioritizes markets, they've created a competitive market between older baby boomers and their own fucking children, right? Baby boomers who got gifted the wealth that are from the demutualization of the economies in the 1980s in the UK and the US are the ones who are continually voting for it now because they see the economy as being inherently competitive and they don't want to lose their comp the competitive part of the, the economy that they were gifted by this demutualization effort. So now, when you look at government policy, it is pensioners competing with young people. This is why young people have rejected neoliberalism, because competition is only good, right, when you're winning, right? People only like competition when they're winning. And millennials and Zoomers are losing every single time because they don't have the, they don't have the, the political capital nor the economic capital to be able to compete properly in this market that's been created. So instead of, you know, people, that's why people say, oh, you're entitled to stuff, because they were the ones who were gifted all of this public sector sell off their wealth benefits. And so whenever you know, people want a slice of that pie that they were gifted, it looks like entitlement to them because they don't realise what they've been gifted at the time. And because they're so fucking entirely you know, brain poisoned by the competitive nature of liberalism, they want to keep that at the expense of everybody else. Because they feel like they earned it. Because that's how things worked before 1979 in the UK. At least more than it did post then, right? They feel like they've earned it because they worked hard. Right? They, made a, you know, they made a life for themselves pre-1979. And they did. I'm not saying that they didn't. But they're, they, they're econo the economic gains that were made for that generation specifically in the 1980s is what's keeping them rich now at the expense of their own children. And that's the real issue, right? And that's why, you know, instead of young people becoming social democrats and just wanting to push back on neoliberalism, Neoliberalism infected so much of the economy and also society, right? Neoliberalism infected so much of it that the wholesale rejection of capitalism has happened within young people at this point in time, right? They don't want, instead of saying we should push back on the amount of competition that's in the economy, that's in society, it's like, no, I want no competition anymore, no competition at all, right? Burn the whole thing to the ground. Let's stop. Let's give up. Let's completely reject the whole basis of capitalist economies at this point. And neoliberalism only neoliberals only have themselves to blame. They only have themselves to blame at this point. And that's also why the neoliberals who are now in charge are being so authoritarian. They're being so authoritarian specifically because they believe in the same things that Hayek believed. That democracy is undermining their perfect competitive marketplace that they were supposed to create using the power of the state. I mean, it's almost kind of Leninist in a way, right? I mean, there's a lot of parallels in the kind of political machinations that were behind Thatcherism and Marxism. More than you'd like to think that there would be. A lot of beliefs in how, and how societal structures are influenced by economic policy. 
you know, the base and superstructure theories behind Marxism is very similar to the kind of statements that you heard around Thatcher about changing the economy to change the soul, right? Using, using the economy as a method. And Marx believed much the same thing, but in the opposite direction. Whereas Marx wanted to be more cooperative, and uh, Thatcher wanted to be more cutthroat and more competitive. And you know, that's the kind of society that we live in right now. So are we, are we just at a point where, it's, where we're rolling back neoliberalism or is it us versus them style politics? Well, it's become us versus them style politics, but it's now the neoliberals of old versus the socialists of new, right? So it's a real, real difficult situation to be in. And so when, you know, we are, they are looking like when under, under Hayek's own principles, that they have a group of people in the country who don't want to compete, they don't want to be part of the, the, the market orthodoxy of neoliberalism, who want to see the state be involved in far more of the economy than what neoliberalism would allow, and demarketize lots of the economy, they are seen as being the people who Hayek warned against in his own writings, who would use democracy to get something that they hadn't earned, for example, who felt like they were entitled to things, when, of course, every human should be entitled to the very basics of life. And so these people look like they are upsetting the economic orthodoxy of neoliberalism and upsetting the perfect competitive marketplace that neoliberalism promised to give people. But the people who are in charge say, well, this can't happen. We can't roll this back. We shouldn't roll this back as per Hayek's writings. So we have to undermine democracy to do that. Why do you think they try to, try to make sure young people couldn't vote using voter ID, for example? Because they felt like they shouldn't have access to democracy. Democracy gets in the way of the perfect market order. That's why neoliberalism is so dangerous and why neoliberal governments are being so authoritarian in the way in which they're trying to engage in policy, why they essentially try and undermine democracy very prima facie at this point. I think you're right, coherent screams, and it's going to be really difficult to go back because, you know, uh, if you fundamentally believe in the, the sanctity of property rights, which most, pe most people do, most people are just liberals with regards to property rights, all that stuff, that's, all that wealth and those assets have been filtered up to the top of the economy, they're never coming back. They're never coming back unless you take them. And liberals don't want to, take, don't want to do that because that violates the fundamental, pr the fundamental pr principle of the baseline classical liberalism of 400 years ago. So you know, the only way to go back is for radical policy and requisition, quite frankly, at this point. Because so much has been funneled upward. I mean, wealth taxes may work, but, you know, how much capital flight are you going to see? In an over-leveraged economy like ours is, like capital flight is one of the main things that's going to lead to a future inflationary spiral if our productive capacity of the economy doesn't increase to compensate. So that's why you, I think it's more likely they're just going to have to, the physical stuff that's owned by people with all of the money who've conglomerated that over the course of the economic gains of neoliberalism, you just, just have to take it away. You have to take it away from these people. Oh, we're happy to do it during a wartime economy, but there is clearly some kind of precedent for this in the, you know, we dispensed with property rights when it came to the ways in which that we were requisitioning stuff away from, you know, Russian oligarchs who had loads of money in London because it's the money laundering capital of the world. Because of course it fucking is, since the policies of Thatcher were instituted in, in, in 79, uh, you know, to, to 92. And obviously Blair after that as well, getting into bed with the financial sector. Given that the UK workers failed to implement a general strike of a minimum service laws and legislation restriction of the right to strike, it's probably going to be barbarism, isn't it? Mm -hmm, quite. There's also this reason why a lot of people will say that social democracy uh, is, you know, is the, the largest bulwark against communism because it takes all of the negative externalities of capitalism and tries to fix it through regulation on behalf of the state. Right? Whereas you see now, there are, far, there are hardly any kind of genuine communists coming out of the, the countries with the, the kind of more embedded liberalism style economies of Western Europe. There are very few communists. In Europe, right? There are social democrats and there are liberals a lot of the time. And then there's a bunch of fascists who hate brown people. There's very few communists. Whereas you look at the US and the UK, the amount of genuine like far left um, 
activism that's happening because of the fact that our countries were the one that had their um, livelihoods ripped away from them by neoliberalism. They're becoming more radical. Right? It's all about the material conditions of the working classes, which are much worse in the UK and the US than they are in countries like Denmark, for example, or Norway, or Finland. And that's why the global south are far more left wing than the global north. Because, you know, they don't have anything to protect because they have been so, had so much of their uh, material wealth taken out of them by imperialism, by colonialism, right? Like, it goes back to the Yellow Parenti lecture where he's talking about, you know, these countries, right? They're not poor. You, know? you don't go to poor countries to make money. They're rich in natural resources, but the people are poor because the Western powers have taken those natural resources to benefit the imperial core at the expense of everybody else. And that's why these, these other countries in the global south are far more left-wing than we are. But also, you know, that's where the UK and the US are going to go. But yet, instead of it's the global south getting mad at the imperial core, it is the working class getting mad at the neoliberal oligarchs that have been created by what is essentially the, the UK's shock doctrine, right? How, if, if anything, is the, is the public sector sell-off of the 1980s during... Um, Thatcher's reign of terror in the UK, how much of that public sector sell-off is any different to the shock doctrine of the early 90s in post-Soviet Russia? How is it any different taking all these natural monopolies and just handing them out to your mates to make a killing and making it unaffordable for working people in the country? How is that any different to the shock doctrine? It's just the shock doctrine, but done, on a, done within a vaguely democratic country. Rather than, an, or rather, than an exist, rather than creating oligarchy out of nowhere. And then we are seeing the effects of the oligarchy right now in the UK. We're just fucking a decade behind Russia at this point in the way that that has kind of man manifested dictatorship. Because again, that's what the neoliberals want. That's what the shock doctrine uh, must precipitate. That's why the, the, uh, this kind of oligarchy was created in Russia and why it's led to dictatorship. Why we're seeing the crackdown on democracy. It's really dangerous. It really is dangerous. There's no checks and balances anymore. Neoliberals don't want checks and balances. And that's why there's, there's, a, there's a very famous Lenin quote, which was, um, uh, no amount of political freedom will satisfy the hungry masses. And I think we're seeing that right now. Um, yeah, no, Klein's really good. Um, I think we're seeing the Lenin's prediction there coming to fruition in that, you know, the masses are now hungry and you have people on the left and on the right of the party wanting to, on the right of the, of, of the country, wanting to see a, a subversion of political freedoms. Whether that's the political freedom of property rights, which the left wants to be able to up, up, upend to redistribute wealth towards the working class, or from the right, who want to see all democratic norms abolished to try and uh, deal with the scapegoat that they have used to blame the economic malaise on that is the response of their own economic policy. The masses are hungry and their will for uh, political freedom is rapidly diminishing. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider liking and subscribing. It does help out the channel and the algorithm. And if you click the bell notification icon, it will let you know when I go live and when I upload videos. If you'd like to follow me on social media, my handle is at NoJusticeMTG, and that is Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. If you want to support my channel in a more financial manner, you can do so by becoming a member for just 99p, by super chatting, or by supporting me on Patreon, with the link is in the description of this video, and hopefully I'll catch you on the next segment.